episode 36. Today I'm wrapping up my series on the diversity of life by exploring the outer edges of life itself. Today I'm going to talk about the things that aren't quite life, but aren't exactly non-life either. Things that have some, but not all, of the fundamental qualities found in all other living things. Specifically, I'm talking about viruses, or virions, which can also be called viral particles, because they're much more like particles of complex biomolecules than any kind of large, organized cell. They don't even have cells. It's not definitively known where or how viruses came into being. There are many theories, but none are conclusively validated by the evidence. One major theory is that viruses are the remnants of some ancient bacteria that lived inside a eukaryotic cell. Some of these ancient bacteria include the ancestors of the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, both of which lost various organelles over time as their purpose within their host cell became more specialized. The general idea behind this hypothesis is that this also happened for viruses. Where mitochondria became specialized for producing ATP, you know, when they lost all of the organelles and genes and biomolecules and things that they don't need for producing ATP, and chloroplasts became specialized for conducting photosynthesis, and they lost all these enzymes and proteins and genes that they don't need to conduct photosynthesis, viruses became specialized at parasitism, at infection. They lost more than a few organelles during their evolutionary origin. They lost cytoplasm, organelles, and almost anything resembling a bacterial cell, with the exception of a handful of protein residue and maybe a plasma membrane coating. There's sizable evidence for this theory, too, including the genome of the largest known virus, which has residual genetic sequences that code for proteins only seen in cells. Another major theory is that viruses emerged not as a simplification of life, but as a small-scale sophistication of biomolecules. There are genetic structures known as plasmids and transposable elements, which are basically small chunks of free-floating DNA that encode one or more proteins. In bacteria, these plasmids are used to transmit genetic information between individuals, like a lateral gene transfer. And in eukaryotes, transposable elements are used in a dynamic form of gene expression. In both cases, these free-floating gene clusters are able to replicate themselves, which makes them another example of pseudo-life, on the edge of life. It's hypothesized that these free-floating genetic particles are flakes, or chunks, that broke off the genome of some more complex organism. These chunks of genes, these gene clusters, contained enough information to encode a few proteins. When these genes are expressed, the proteins would cluster around the DNA like a primitive capsid. This step up from biomolecules to replicating biomolecular machinery would have subjected the virus ancestors to evolution, shaping their genes and their bodies as if they were the tiniest organisms. But they're not organisms, not quite. There's a third theory about the origin of viruses, uh, a newer theory, which posits that they're the descendants of some of the first life on Earth. The theory takes support from the RNA world hypothesis, which itself argues that life on Earth began as the more rudimentary and unstable RNA, which subsequently evolved into DNA, and DNA is what all living things currently have in their cells. This implies several things about the nature of life and the origin of life, namely that there was first an RNA gene pool before there was a DNA gene pool. And this RNA pool would have been characterized by different genes than those in the DNA pool. This hypothesis is validated by the fact that viruses have a number of genes that code for proteins that haven't been seen in any kind of cell. These are proteins and their associated gene sequences that are entirely unique to viruses, which implies that they originated from an earlier gene pool, a separate gene pool, one that originated first, and from which the DNA gene pool diverged. Although this is strong evidence in favor of the RNA world hypothesis, and this particular hypothesis for the origin of viruses, the issue is far from settled. The origin of viruses is shrouded in mystery. They seem to be an ubiquitous, ever-present aspect of life, and yet we just haven't figured out how they first appeared. Viruses have been extensively studied and organized based on their genetics, their outward appearance or their phenotype, 
the host that they infect, and the nature of the diseases that they cause. This process of classification is called the Baltimore classification, after its creator, David Baltimore. The original criteria in the Baltimore classification was just how the virus produced mRNA for the intermediate step in gene expression. Using just this criterion, just how mRNA is produced, viruses have been organized into seven major groups, or classes, that are numbered one through seven. Three of these classes have DNA, and four have RNA. The viruses that possess DNA include the adenoviruses, herpes and pox viruses, parvoviruses and hepadenoviruses, among many others. Those with RNA include the retroviruses, the picornaviruses, the togaviruses, the rhabdoviruses, and the orthomyxoviruses, and many more. The Baltimore classification came out in 1971, and since that time, it's been modified, with the more specific criteria that I mentioned a moment ago ingrained into its taxonomy. When you take all of these criteria into account, from the genotype and phenotype to the host and the nature of infectious disease, biologists have been able to taxonomically group viruses into 70 families, each family containing several genuses and numerous species. Despite these classifications and all that we know about them, viruses still remain a largely cryptic biological puzzle with many unanswered questions. Viruses are strange, enigmatic things. They're pathogens composed of a small handful of biomolecules organized into a really simple structure, like a column or a polyhedron. Compared to cells, viruses are very small and very simple, lacking the sophistication and complexity to really be considered their own self-sufficient organisms. While viruses are without a doubt an animated structure composed of organic molecules, they aren't really considered to be truly alive because they don't fit all of the criteria for life. Like, they, they fit some, but not all. For example, they're, they're too small to be made of cells, and what they are isn't even close to a cell in the first place. Second, even though they have DNA, they lack virtually all of the biochemical machinery that's necessary to sustain life, like the enzymes that reproduce that DNA, or enzymes that are involved in chemical digestion, or so many other things. They just don't have them. Because viruses lack all of these things, they can't make their own ATP, or their own nucleotides, to repair their DNA. In order to get the raw chemical building blocks to replicate themselves, viruses must invade a host cell and seize control of its enzymes and its ATP and all of, all of its chemical resources. The virus hijacks the host cell and uses its biochemical machinery to make the energy and proteins and nucleotides that it needs. The virus also takes over the reproductive machinery of the cell and uses it instead to create more viruses. In some cases, the viruses accumulate within the host cell until it explodes, sending a cloud of new virus particles in all directions so they can infect more cells. A viral infection is essentially your body's cells being hijacked by generation after generation of viral particles, reproducing in pulsing waves of cellular destruction. As far as illnesses go, some viral infections are relatively mild or easy to treat or cure while other viruses are extremely dangerous and often fatal, like Ebola, West Nile, HIV, and rabies. Where bacterial cells are many times smaller than your average eukaryotic cell, viral particles or individual viruses are many times smaller than bacteria. They're so small, mostly because the virus is quite literally just a few biomolecules arranged in a little organized complex. All viruses have a primary body composed of a sheet or a coat of proteins called a capsid. The capsid is literally like a capsule or a container which holds the virus's genetic material. Some viruses, like smallpox among many others, have both a capsid and an outer membrane that's studded with proteins just like an animal cell. These are called enveloped viruses because they're literally contained within a plasma envelope while viruses with just the bare capsid are called naked or uncoded viruses. Some viral capsids are composed of a string of proteins that spiral into a long, thin tube shape. Other kinds of capsids are shaped like a polyhedron, such as the icosahedral capsid of the adenovirus, 
or the globular shape of a typical bacteriophage. Some of the capsids within a plasma envelope are little more than squished sacs composed of proteins, like a sock stuffed inside another sock. In the case of some bacteriophages, their globular protein capsids are connected to a short tube of proteins, and at the end of the tube, there protrudes a number of simple, kind of insect-like uh, or stalk-like appendages, and these are used like feet to latch onto a host cell's outer membrane. Within every virus's capsid exists some quantity of genetic material. Viruses have a particularly wide variety in their DNA, with some using DNA and some using RNA. Of those viruses that possess some kind of DNA, some use double-stranded DNA, while others only have a single strand. This is true for those that possess RNA as well. You know, some have double-stranded RNA, which isn't as stable as double-stranded DNA, and others use just single-stranded RNA. This is all pretty simple so far, uh, except it starts to get more complicated when we look closer at the viruses with single-stranded RNA. This particular subset of viruses can be divided further into three groups called positive sense, negative sense, and ambisense. Okay, try to recall the details of transcription and translation, which I covered in episode 15. In order for the gene to be expressed as a protein, it must first be transcribed from DNA into mRNA, which is then translated and used in the construction of the protein. The positive sense RNA viruses have genetic material with codon sequences that are identical to the mRNA required to create those proteins. The negative sense RNA viruses have genetic material with complementary codon sequences, not identical sequences. The ambisense RNA viruses have two regions of their RNA genome. They have a single-stranded RNA, and it's split into two parts. One that's complementary to the mRNA, and one that's identical. So viruses in this third group have qualities from both. During the infection of a host cell, the viral genetic material is expelled into the host cell, where it hijacks the host's cellular machinery, its enzymes and its nutrients, and all that stuff to produce the proteins that the virus wants to produce, not the cell. This infection process can be broken down into six basic steps, or stages. The first step involves the virus attaching to the host cell and somehow entering the cytosol, entering the interior guts of the cell where it's most vulnerable. Once inside the cell, the virus begins the second stage by expressing its genes into viral proteins, using the cellular machinery of its host cell, because it doesn't have that cellular machinery of its own. That's why it has to exploit the host cell. In the third stage, after the virus has produced its proteins, it replicates its genome. And this leads to the fourth stage, where the replicated genome is inserted into the newly created bodies of replicated viral capsids. In the fifth stage, the miniviruses replicated in the host cell break free somehow, either through leaking out or merging through the, through the membrane by being expelled from the host as it, uh, as it defends itself, or by causing the host cell to explode, which sends viruses flying in all directions. The sixth stage involves the new viruses searching for a, a new host where they can land and start the process all over again back at stage one. To look at the process in more detail, this first stage involves the virus getting past the host cell's defenses. So how do they do it? How do these little parasitic packets of DNA invade the cell of its host? Basically, how do viruses infect cells? This ability is a fundamental aspect of the virus's life cycle, and it's the reason we have things like viral epidemics and plagues that cause widespread misery and death crop failure, extinction, that kind of stuff. So on a molecular level, viruses have to attach to and getting into the host cell find themselves in a bit of a challenge and a bit of a dilemma. Uh, and and th from this, from this stress, this evolutionary pressure, comes a huge part of the variety of viruses. It's why some viruses can infect you while others can't. It has to do with their strategies for breaching the host cell. Plant cells, for example, have cell walls, and plant viruses have to find a way to get through the dense cell wall to infect and exploit the cell itself. In many cases, the virus has found it 
easiest to simply wait on the mouth parts of an insect, like its jaws or its mandibles or its little suction cups or whatever. In many cases, the insect will eventually go find a plant to eat. And as the insect uh, chews, scrapes, and sucks at the plant's tissue, the virus is able to infect the plant cells by exploiting the holes and abrasions that the insect caused in their cell walls. Once through the cell wall, the viruses are exposed to the cell membrane. And so these plant viruses just burn their way through it. They excrete lysozyme enzymes, and these uh, are, are pretty acidic little enzymes, and they literally burn holes in the plasma membrane of the plant cell, and then the plant virus just enters this incinerated hole. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, and they too have to find a way to get past a cell wall. Bacteria are usually coated in a cell wall like gram-positive bacteria, which have a thicker cell wall that's primarily composed of peptidoglycan. There are gram-negative bacteria, uh, which have thinner cell walls with other materials besides peptidoglycan, but I covered this more in the first episode of the series on bacteria and archaea. Because bacteria are so small, they aren't really vulnerable to having their cell walls torn open by insect chewing, like plant cells are. Bacteriophages have to find some other way to get past the cell wall, which usually involves them finding a way to bind to it and burn or dig their way through it. Some of the tactics that they've evolved to do this are pretty gnarly. Some use their tail fibers, or their, their little insect-like feet. They use them like shovels to dig and scrape through the cell wall until they reach the membrane. Other bacteriophages are a little more sophisticated. They use an appendage like a, a needle or a syringe that stabs through the cell wall and punctures the bacterial membrane. This needle appendage is literally like a syringe because once it's punctured through the cell's tissue, the virus injects its genetic material into the cell. You know, it uses that little needle structure to inject its genetic material to take over the cell. Viruses that infect animals don't really have to deal with a cell wall because animal cells don't have cell walls. But animal viruses do have to deal with a sophisticated animal immune system, with multiple layers of physical, chemical, and genetic defenses. The viruses first must bind with a chemical on the cell's surface, and this usually tends to be some kind of biomolecule with a sugar residue bound to it, like a glycolipid or a glycoprotein. After interacting with a molecule on the cell surface, it signals to the cell that the virus is there. The cell responds in some manner to ingest the virus, or bring it into itself. In most cases, this is done through endocytosis, which is a normal process in the cell. It's, it's where the cell ingests something by enclosing it in a little membrane bubble called an endosome. The outer membrane kind of envelops this little food particle, or whatever it happens to be. And through this envelopment, a little bud comes off the membrane inside the cell, and the bud contains the ingested food item. The endosome is like a little tiny chemical stomach. Associated enzymes pump out chemicals that turn the inside of the endosome into a bath of acid. The acidic conditions typically decay and destroy almost anything that the cell ingests, but not quite so for viruses. Shaped by evolution, the virus has proteins that actually activate and work more efficiently in a higher acidity environment. So when the cell tries to digest the virus, it actually activates it and initiates a process where the virus's membrane merges with the endosome membrane. By merging, the virus can release its genetic material from its membrane, but outside of the endosome and into the cytosol, or the interior of the now-infected cell. If this process seems a little abstract, consider this uh, admittedly maybe equally abstract metaphor for the interaction. The virus is kind of like a secret agent who specializes in instigating rebellions in enemy countries. And you can think of the enemy country as like the host's body. The secret agent deliberately gets noticed by the hostile authorities, and they're immediately taken into custody. When they're in the prison, the secret agent begins to do their work and they turn the prisoners against the guards in a violent revolt. The prisoners break out of the prison, and the secret agent gets away and does it again at another prison. 
This is like how the virus alerts the cell to its presence, gets ingested through endocytosis, but fuses with the endosome to get its genes into the cytosol, where it takes over and eventually kills the cell. While a lot of viruses use this technique of violently hijacking an endosome, other viruses, like HIV, have a more sophisticated system. HIV interacts with two different molecules on the cell's surface, and this allows it to stabilize in such a way that it can merge its viral membrane directly with the cell's plasma membrane. As the membrane coating in the capsid merges with the cell's membrane, the capsid is pushed all the way through into the cell, like a person going through a stargate to step onto an entirely new planet. The capsid decays, revealing the virus's genetic material, which is now present in the cytoplasm, and it goes on to infect the cell. Okay, so now in the process, the virus has completed step one. It's bound itself somehow to the cell wall or the membrane, and it's done something to bypass these obstacles and get its DNA or its RNA into the host cell itself. So now what? Instead of identifying the viral genetic material as foreign, the host cell mistakes it for safe DNA and begins to express it. Some viruses have plasma membranes, and just like the plant and animal membranes, it has specific membrane-bound proteins within it. The virus DNA that codes for these membrane proteins goes through the host cell system as if it was the cell's own membrane proteins. Proteins in the virus capsid itself are typically expressed by free-floating cytosolic ribosomes. In the case of viruses with plasma membranes, these capsids migrate towards the cell membrane and merge through the patch of viral membrane proteins expressed earlier. This bubble of a membrane, studded with viral proteins, wraps around the viral capsid as it leaves the cell's membrane, and it creates a new virus. But viruses aren't just proteins with the occasional membrane. They also have genetic material, like DNA, or some kind of negative sense, positive sense, or ambisense RNA. So how does this get copied? Making new genetic material is a lot more difficult than making proteins. For one, the process is much more tightly regulated. Viruses with DNA are able to use enzymes already present within the host cell to just print out more DNA. But viruses with RNA weren't as lucky, and they had to evolve various means of replicating that didn't involve just simply hijacking the cell's own enzymes. Some viruses use proteins called RNA replicases, which use the host cell nucleotides to build a complementary strand of RNA. This complementary strand is then used as a template to build more of the original viral RNA. There are other kinds of viruses called retroviruses, and these use a different technique. They have an enzyme called a reverse transcriptase that can make a complementary strand of DNA from its original RNA. This is like the opposite of traditional eukaryotic DNA replication, which involves the information in the DNA being transcribed temporarily into RNA and then back into DNA. In these viruses, however, the RNA gets transcribed into DNA, which exploits the host cell's enzymes to turn it back into RNA. Once all the proteins and genetic material is constructed, they assemble into new viruses. This assembly process is not well understood. Various species of virus have their replicated clones assembled on the cell's membrane, or somewhere in the cytosol, or on the membrane of an organelle. Some build the capsid first, and then put the genetic material inside of it, while other viruses build the capsid around the genetic material directly. The details of all these processes aren't very well understood, so much so that we don't really have any pharmaceutical drugs that inhibit the assembly portion of a virus life cycle. The host cell, having had its internal machinery and enzymes literally hijacked by the virus, prints out more and more of the constituent parts of its infector, usually until the host cell eventually dies. Those viruses that have a plasma membrane coating are able to simply merge with the host cell's membrane, and butt off from the outside, departing the original host cell in search of another one to infect. This process is relatively clean and graceful compared to what uncoded viruses do. Naked viruses or uncoded viruses are those without a plasma membrane, 
And in all actuality, this is most viruses. So these uncoded viruses just replicate inside the host cell until they literally fill up all of its internal volume, and the internal pressure causes the cell to explode. Literally, these viruses force the host cell to continue replicating them until the cell has no more internal space, and the internal pressure causes it to lice, or explode, or collapse, or otherwise suffer a catastrophic structural failure that spills the new viral particles into the local environment. This is where they all explode out at once, and they get a little movement boost from the, uh, from the pressure releasing. This allows them to spread pretty far and, and infect nearby cells. And in fact, this is how viruses spread through your whole body, as they can infect cells near your bloodstream and spill new viral particles directly into your circulatory system. Viruses can propagate by spreading throughout a body, but they thrive by spreading from organism to organism, from individual to individual. This is why many viral infections cause us to leak from our nose and our mouth and to cough and sneeze, which is all the better for the virus because it helps the virus spread. If the virus infects cells in your nose, it spreads through contact with mucus and snot. If the virus infects your blood cells, contact with blood risks a new infection. If the virus is respiratory, it's likely spread through sneezing, coughing, or through saliva. It's kind of terrifying when you step back and look at viruses as a whole. They're extremely small packets of biomolecules, shaped by billions of years of evolutionary combat against a multitude of defensive chemicals and sophisticated immune systems. These little infection packets hijack a cell, a chemical structure orders of magnitude larger and more complex than itself, and they exploit it until perhaps the cell is forced to suicide in a violent explosion of new viruses. This happens with such regularity that millions of cells can get infected, and the entire organism begins to suffer. Polio is a virus, as is HIV, influenza, and Ebola. All of these viral infections cause diseases in millions of people every year, leading to tens and hundreds of thousands of deaths, mostly in poor rural areas with little to no access to vaccines or any kind of reliable health care. Because viruses can alter the behavior of their hosts, and perhaps even kill them, viruses have a strong evolutionary influence on the species they infect. One of the reasons their hosts often have sophisticated immune systems in the first place is partly because of viral infections over thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. Viruses evolve some method of invasion or deception, and the host's immune system shortly thereafter evolves some new defense. The virus evolves a new tactic, and in response, the host evolves another new defense, and so on and so forth throughout eons of time in what's known as an evolutionary arms race. When I refer to life as a tide of carbon perpetuating itself through time, it should be said further that this life interacts with itself in physical space, engaging in direct and indirect relationships, and these cause overlap in the currents and the tide. To prolong their lifespan, some animal viruses have evolved the ability to halt the part of their life cycle involved in active replication. The virus hides itself through some method, including going so far as to incorporate its viral DNA directly into the host DNA directly into the host genome. The evolutionary arms race is perpetual, ongoing through billions of years into the present moment, operating as evolution does on its timescale of tens and hundreds of thousands of years. Some viruses are unable to infect humans, and many of those that can infect humans aren't necessarily fatal. For example, chickenpox is a virus that is relatively harmless in children, responsible for little more than a temporary rash of itchy red spots. Contagious, yes. Annoying and really itchy, yeah. Prone to infection if repeatedly scratched, yes. But ultimately, it's not fatal. Well, not really fatal in children. If someone never got chickenpox as a child, or if they never got vaccinated, they would have never developed an immunity to it. Contracting chickenpox as an adult is actually much more dangerous, as it can progress into shingles, and it poses a lethal risk. There are retroviruses, like simian foamy virus, or the SFV, which is present in most primates born in captivity, 
but is associated with no obvious symptoms. The SFV may not cause any visible symptoms of infection, but it has to be doing something internally, like suppressing the host's immune system, because it makes the infected primate much more vulnerable to other viruses. HIV is also a retrovirus, as is feline leukemia, which can affect litters or entire populations of domesticated cats. Pox viruses include such diseases as cowpox and smallpox, and other more exotic pox diseases like monkeypox and uh, Yaba monkey tumor virus. In the case of Yaba monkey tumor virus, the infection literally causes the formation of tumorous growths across the monkey's body. Interestingly, uh, these tumors aren't permanent, and two to three months after infection, when the virus has kind of moved along, the tumors begin to recede and disappear. Orthomyxoviruses are a diverse family with species that can infect several species of fish, arthropods, birds, and mammals. Bird flu, or avian influenza, is one such virus, which belongs to a genus called Influenza virus A. I'm not trying to scare you or fearmonger or anything like that, but the species within this genus are pretty much responsible for all of the viral pandemics in human history. The Spanish flu that hit the world right after World War I was an orthomyxovirus. Various strains of bird flu have infected humans, like the notorious virus strain H7N9, which caused a lot of fear and uncertainty in China in 2013, right when it was first documented and starting to spread. But fortunately, most countries have various organizations, in America like the CDC, that track the progress of diseases and viruses and things like this, and try and find ways to contain them, or vaccinate against them, or even treat or cure them. It's an ongoing battle, and it's one that really can't ever be won unless you just outright eradicate the virus like we did with smallpox. They're always evolving, always adapting, and any antiviral medication that we come out with, unless it just hits them really hard in a, in a part of their DNA that they just have no chance of evolving a defense against, Unless that happens, eventually they're going to evolve a way around our, our medications, and we're just going to have to come up with new ones and have new strategies for protecting ourselves from viral infections. Alright, that's pretty much all I have for you today about viruses. This was a fun episode to study for and write, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Despite a few moments of extreme ugliness, like talking about the mass death and suffering that viruses can cause, and pandemics and outbreaks and that kind of stuff. When you hear about how viruses cause global suffering and the death of millions, it can be a little challenging to stay upbeat, although I guess that's just to be expected when you're talking about something like viruses. On the other hand, there were certainly quite a few points with extremely interesting details, like the origin and the evolution of viruses, their method of spreading, and the diseases they cause. I hope you found these little tidbits just as interesting as I did, and I hope you got a kick out of this episode and this playlist on the diversity of life in general. As always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support The Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 